of chapter 4, and I'm going to start reading at verse number 1. And he began again to teach by the seaside. And there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables. And said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty, and some sixty, and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted, and their sins should be forgiven them. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside, and where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately, and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some an hundred. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text that we're considering this evening as we consider this parable of the soil and how it's up to us, Lord, what kind of soil we are. And I pray, Lord, that we will endeavor to be good soil. Uh, we'll uh, get rid of those weeds, Lord, and we'll determine to be resolved to take a stand for the truth and to follow our Savior. And I pray, Lord, that we won't be so distracted that the devil can just take what we hear away from us. Lord, I pray this evening as we think of the sower and the seed, I pray that you'll speak to each heart according to each need. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. A few Wednesday nights ago, we mentioned this fact that uh, men, men say 25,000 words a day and women say 30,000 words a day. And we talk an awful lot, don't we? But you know what we're finding more and more in this world is that although we have a lot to say, it seems that listening has become a bit of a lost art. Uh, we often have problems here. I find when I get into a louder room or something else making a noise in the background, I, uh, I often mishear people. Like this morning in Sunday school class, William asked me some question. I thought he said, you need to take the cheese off your pizza. And I was just like, what does that have to do with anything in Sunday school, William? But he didn't say that. But my ears are just not what they ought to be when the air conditioner was right beside me. We do have an air conditioner on the very top floor. It doesn't really do much, I'll be honest. But it's nice to have it because it was hot today. It's still hot today. But, um, you know, it's, uh, there's this one man that tells the story. He went to this large get-together, and uh, all these people are talking. And he says, aren't these large get-togethers? Nobody actually is listening to you. So he went around the room and he would introduce, he said, talk to people and say, how are you doing? He said, well, my, my business went belly up this week. 
my wife left me. He said, I, I, uh, I, I had to, I had to, I had to leave, move, I had to foreclose on my house, the bank foreclosed on my house, and I have terminal can- cancer, to which the people would respond, wonderful, and shake his hand and keep on going, because nobody's listening. We have ears, but do we hear? We have eyes, but do we see? We've been going through this book, this gospel of Mark, and one thing that we've noticed is that is the words that our Savior has spoken. He spoke as one that has authority and not as the scribes. And they all flocked to him to hear the words that he spake, because no man ever spake like this man. He preached in all their synagogues. He preached in all the villages of Galilee. He preached in Peter's house. He preached the word. And they thronged to hear him. But were they actually listening? Did they actually take in what he had to say? In our text, the subject, the main point of this passage of Scripture is our listening. Our Savior starts off with the word in verse number three, hearken. Listen, listen to what I'm about to say. How is your listening today? And Uh, He had been speaking to multitudes, speaking to all the crowds, and they were there hearing the words that he said. They had eyes to see and ears to hear, but they weren't actually hearing. For many of them, the word that was preached had no effect because it wasn't mixed with faith. And in verse 12, it's clear. They heard, but they didn't understand. Verse number 12, verse 11 tells how he spoke all these things in parables. In verse 12, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. They were hearing the Lord Jesus Christ speak the word of God, but they weren't understanding, and it wasn't having an, it wasn't changing their, their lives, making them new creatures in Christ. They weren't being converted. And so this evening, we're going to look at this parable, the parable of the sower. What's a parable? Well, a parable, someone said it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's literally, it's an illustration. It's a, the word parable is the same word later on in chapter four, where we have the word comparison. And uh, he says, to what comparison shall we compare the kingdom of God to in verse 30? And that's the same word as parable. And it's just simply the Lord giving a word picture, an illustration. He's showing an earthly truth and making a heavenly application. And so in this parable, he's telling the story of a farmer going out to sow his field, something that we've all heard of, we've all seen, we've all understand how they go out and they plant the seed. And there he is planting the seed and some falls on the wayside, on on the ground that's been trodden underfoot. And it doesn't go into the soil at all. It's just snatched up right away by the birds of the air. Then some falls on stony ground. And uh, what it means by stony ground, isn't that like there was gravel or all through it, but it means that it wasn't a very deep layer, but underneath the layer, a thin layer of, of dirt was like a big rock. Like, you know, in Nova Scotia, you go and you see all these places with massive rocks and then just a thin layer of grass or a thin layer of soil. Well, that's what it's referring to. The kind of ground where it's just a tiny bit of dirt, not really enough dirt to actually plant something. And so he plants it on the soil, the stony ground, and it it starts to sprout up because, you know, it doesn't have much depth to it. But as soon as the sun comes up, it's scorched and it withers away because it has no root. Then he talks about those that fall among the thorns the thorns in the midst, and it falls in the soil. It looks like everything's okay. It's growing up. It's looking fine. But over time, the thorns choke out the plant so that it can't bear any fruit. And the last one is, of course, the good soil, the soil that brings forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some a hundredfold. And Our Lord tells the meaning of the parable to the disciples. 
He tells them the sower is sowing the seed. The seed is the word of God. So the sower in the parable then would be the, uh, the Savior first, and then the apostles, and then everyone today that preaches the word of God. The soil then is the hearts of men. It's our hearts. It's us as we're hearing the word of God. And the, so often with this parable, uh, we call it the parable of the sower. But in our text, our Savior is emphasizing the soil. And the question is for us today, what kind of soil is your heart? Do you have a heart that is receptive to the word of God or not? So this, this evening, I'd like to just look at these, this parable and the three types of soil, the, the three bad types of soil, and think we want to be, uh, I'll just ask for hands. Would you like to be good soil? Eh, I think everybody wants to be good soil. We want to be someone that brings forth fruit. We want to be productive in our Christian lives. We want to be useful for the Lord. We want to see him, his image shining through us. Okay, well, if we want to be good soil, then it's going to come down to the condition of our heart, the condition of our the way we receive the word of God. And so this evening, I want to ask you, what kind of soil are you? How is it that we make sure that we are the kind of soil that grows and brings forth fruit? Well, the first truth for us, as we think of the seed sown by the wayside, number one, if we're going to be good soil, the number one, you have to have an open heart. You have to have an open heart. You have to have a heart that is willing to receive the word of God. The seed by the wayside is the one where the person hears the word of God. And before it ever gets a chance to enter the heart, before it ever gets a chance to go down inside, the devil comes along and takes it away. Has no effect. Why is that? Why didn't that person? I mean, they heard the same preaching as the person beside them. They heard the same message. They, they grew up maybe in the same family. They, they had the same chances. Why didn't, they ha why didn't the word of God affect them? Because their heart was closed. Their heart was closed to what it heard and never received the word of God. You can be closed. You can be a hard heart and not actually hear the word of God as it's been spoken. So I think of having an open heart. What does that mean? Well, first of all, if you're not going to have an open heart, then number one, you can't be too busy. You can't be too busy. Often we go out on the street, and throughout the summer we go out on the street on Tuesday nights, and we pass our tracks. You know what we see? A lot of busy people, don't we? People are going to this engagement, that engagement, going here, going there, and and uh, they don't have the time to think of even what it is that you're offering them as you stand and offer them the word of God. And so many times people are too busy to take the time to listen to God's word and study it and see what it says. In the text, we have those on the wayside who just don't, uh, who just don't get, let the word get into their heart. But before they ever has the chance to, the devil comes and takes it away. How does he take it away? Well, it's simple. He just distracts them. He distracts them. It, maybe, it's a, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a nice serving note, but uh, oh, it's over. I got to see what's on my phone now, you know. Maybe it's a dad and it's after the sermon. His little ones are coming up to him and they're saying, hey, dad, what this? What about this? And, and he's got so much of a family commitment that he's distracted and not able to focus on what he's heard. I mean, it's yes, we heard something from the word today, but you know, uh, something that my son Nate and I did this afternoon. But the Blue Jays are playing. <laughs> it's time to see what's going on with the Blue Jays and forget about what God's spoken to us through his word. And, you know, sometimes it's business. Sometimes it's school, sometimes it's friends, sometimes it's family, sometimes it's different things. And it's not that these distractions are necessarily anything wrong with them. It's just rather than 
listen to God's word and focus on God's word and meditate on God's word, we allow ourselves to get pulled away somewhere else and don't spend the time in it that we need to, that we ought to, that we have to, if we're going to be the kind of soil that grows and brings forth fruit. Some people are too busy, and so the devil uses those distractions to snatch it away. No, if you're going to be good soil and have an open heart, number two, you can't just not be, uh, not be busy, but you also you can't be bored. You know, I think sometimes there are people that just simply don't realize how wonderful the Bible is. Sometimes people just don't realize how exciting this book is. It's more up to date, you know, than next week's newspaper. I have to say next week because, I mean, tomorrow's newspaper is typically out of date. But um, next week's newspaper, it's more up to date then. It's more exciting. It's more exciting than the Super Bowl. It has more intrigue than the world's greatest mystery novel. And yet how often would people rather have their amusements than the Word of God? You know what amusements are? The devil loves to fill man's time with amusements. What's an amusement? Well, the word muse means to think, to meditate on, to to focus on this. And when you put that one letter A in front of it and say amuse, it means don't think, not to think. And we have our amusements, don't we? We have television, we have theme parks, we have uh, all these other things that we do just to amuse ourselves and not think. And so often God is trying to speak to us, trying to have his word impact us, but we allow the devil to fill our lives with amusements so that we don't actually listen to what God has to say. If we're going to bear fruit, if we're going to be good soil, you can't be bored with God. You've got to meditate on it. You've got to take the time to study it. Uh, There's a lady who, by the name of Mrs. Jones, I don't know if it's related to the Joneses, but she was reading her Bible every day, and her her four-year-old had asked, had observed this study over years, and finally, or not over years, I mean, she's only four years old, but anyways, had observed this study for a long time, and she finally said to her mother, when are you going to be done with that book? <laughs> Never. Keep studying it. Keep reading it. And uh, we got we to gotta stay. We, 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 the Word of God is an exciting book. And we need to read it more, more excitedly than you read the latest sports magazine or whatever it is that people read these days. You can't be bored. You can't be busy. But, you know, if you're going to have an open heart to the Word of God and receive it, What else you can't be? You can't be bitter. You can't be bitter. I think of the seed on the wayside. Why is the wayside so so hard? Why is it that no, no, no seed can go down there? Because the wayside is where people walk. The wayside is where people have trodden it underfoot. And it's been trampled so much that it's no longer in a place where it's receptive to the word of God. You know, so often that happens in real life, doesn't it? We get trampled on. We get hurt. We have offenses. We have different things. And sometimes a person has been so offended that they no longer are receptive to the word of God. And we can't allow bitterness to stop us, to make us tune out God's letter to us. So often people get bitter, and the one they stop refusing to listen to is God. He's the one they try to tune out. And yet, don't they know nobody loves them like the Lord? He loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son to die on the cross for your sins. He loves you so much that he sent you the rain, sent you the blessings from above, sent you every good and perfect gift. He loves you so much he's preparing a place for you so that when he comes again, he can receive you onto himself that where he is there, you may be also. If you know him as your savior, if you just open up your heart and listen to the word of God, it will make all the difference in the world. If we're going to bear fruit and be the good soil, number one, you have to have an open heart. But I see secondly in the text, not only do we have to have an open heart, 
But secondly, you have to have a resolved heart, a resolved heart. The second thing that we think of in this text isn't just the seed sown by the wayside, but in verse number 16, we have the seed sown on stony ground. Verse 16, and these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. The stony ground. Who are these sun-scorched people who bear no fruit? Who are these ones that don't have enough depth in their soil to resist the heat of the sun? They're the ones who, when they hear the word, they actually immediately receive it with gladness. They say, finally, this is the good news I've been looking for. Finally, I'm so excited to hear about the wonderful love of God. That's exactly what I want. I want to have what he's preaching about. I want to have what they're talking about. I want that for myself. And then as time goes on, and not much time, by the way, it doesn't take long. As time goes by, inevitably, there will be affliction. There will be persecution that arises for the word's sake. And immediately they're offended. They're caused to stumble. They fall and don't get back up. How many times have you seen this? How many times have you witnessed that? They come, they're excited, excited to have the word of God, excited about the Bible, excited about the things of God. But inevitably, the devil causes some affliction, some persecution for the word's sake. And the next thing you know, where did they go? They've fallen away because their roots weren't deep. They weren't committed enough. They didn't have the resolution, the resolved heart to keep going in the face of adversity. And I'm reminded today, if you're going to bring forth fruit, you have to have a resolved heart. You know, if you got to stand through the trials of adversity, nobody ever said that when you became a Christian, that was the end of your problems. Nobody ever said that when you became a Christian, it would just be easy from here on out. No, our Savior said, in this world, ye shall have tribulation. In this world, there will be trials. There will be hard times. But don't give up. Don't quit. You've got to resolve to stand in the face of adversity. You also have to stand through trials of affliction or persecution. That's what the text is specifically speaking of. Affliction and persecution for the word's sake. And now you don't have to be saved all that long before you run into affliction or persecution for the word's sake. You don't have to be on the narrow way long before you face the giant of despair or the slough of despondency or the persecution at Vanity Fair. You don't have to be in God's way long before Apollyon, the devil himself, tries to trip you up. You know, it might be in the form of friends who make fun might be in the form of family who have nothing to do with it. It might be losing a promotion. It might be losing popularity. Or maybe it's just that there's some truths in the Bible. A piece of truth that's hard. Like the truths that we talked about this morning with the judgment to come. Maybe it's a circumstance in life that's led to great hurt. Because of that, you're tempted to fall or maybe have. But you know, the just man falls seven times and rises again. And what you need is a heart that's resolved, a heart that's determined, a heart that says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I'm not turning back. If you have ears to hear and grow and bring forth fruit, if you're to be the good soil, you need that committed heart. You know, it's interesting that this word for affliction in our text, it's the word that Paul uses in First Corinthians, or Second Corinthians chapter 1, Verse number eight, when he refers to the trouble that came upon him when he was in Ephesus. Anyone hear about the trouble that came upon him when he was in Ephesus? There he was in Ephesus and the mob rose against him and they were crying, great is Diana, goddess of the Ephesians. And they're, they're like they were going to pull the missionaries apart. And that's what this word 
pressure, or this word affliction means. It's referring to great pressure. It's referring to that idea of just uh, being pressed beyond measure. I'm told that in England, in ancient England, not today in England, in ancient England, there was a type of legal punishment where they would kill the victim by placing heavy weights on his chest until he was crushed to death. That's the pressure, affliction. That's that word affliction, the feeling like the world is caving in on you, wondering what's going to happen next. How am I going to make it? The word persecution in the text is the idea of being chased, the idea of being pursued when you're running for your life, looking for some place to hide. And believe it or not, being a Christian isn't always popular. It's uh, naming the name of Christ, talking and acting like Christ, and speaking for Christ comes with persecution, comes with affliction. And we need Christians like Daniel, who before they ever get there, they've purposed in their heart. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat or the wine that he drank. We need Christians like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who when everyone else around them is bending the knee and bowing to the image, who is standing, standing up for the Lord because they've committed their lives to him. And what you need is deep roots, don't you? You need deep roots. It's more than just a superficial profession. It needs to be genuine. It needs to be real. It needs to be a real relationship with Christ, where Christ has really changed you. That will give you the courage to stand. I love the story of that Christian man that wrote the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. I'm told that those words were the last words of an Indian man named Nak Singh, a Garo man who, along with his family, decided to follow Jesus Christ in the middle of the 19th century through the efforts of an American Baptist missionary. And the chief wasn't happy with the decision. And his decision divided him and his family from the chief and the village. And the chief put him on trial and called for him to renounce his faith. But he said, I have decided to follow Jesus. They took his children and put them to death. They threatened his wife. And at the same time, he declared further, though no one join me, still I will follow. They say that his wife was killed and he was executed while singing, the world behind me, the cross before me. He was determined, wasn't he? He was committed. And praise the Lord, we haven't seen that kind of persecution here in Canada. You know, it doesn't matter. We need to resolve to stand no matter what. We need to be determined that we're living for Christ, come what may. And so you need to have a resolved heart if you're going to bring forth fruit. You need an open heart. You need a resolved heart. But then number three in our text, we see that if we're to bring forth fruit, number three, you must have a pure heart. You must have a pure heart. The third kind of soil that's mentioned in our text that's not the good ground that we're striving to be, the third kind is the thorny ground. In verse number 18, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. You need to have a pure heart. What I mean by that is you need to have, have a heart that is single focused. You need a heart that is seeking Jesus only. A heart that is only satisfied with him. You need a heart that is pure. If you're to bear fruit, you need a pure heart. And as we consider this third example, I'm reminded that, you know, if we're going to be good soil, we got to keep ourselves from the weeds, don't we? One thing that you find out when you garden is that, uh, you know, you need to, you need to weed the garden. When my wife and I first got married, this was, so we got married 13 years ago. This must have been like 10 years ago. We decided that we were going to take up some gardening. And you got to understand, like I, I'm the son of a gardener. You know my mother, okay? My mother is a crazy gardener, okay? And my wife's father, he always had a massive vegetable garden. So 
She grew up in farm town in, Min in Manitoba and, and Ontario. And so she was used to big gardens. So we had this big idea that we were going to have this massive garden. Bought a truckload of dirt. We, I say it was a large, large garden or backyard that we just made. And we were going to, we planted and we were all excited about our garden. You know what I found out? I really don't like gardening. <laughs> I'm not like my mother. I'm like my mother in some ways, I, I guess, because I must be. But when it comes to the gardening, that's not me. And it's not my wife either. And you know what we didn't like? We especially didn't like the weeding of the garden. And you know how much fruit we got that year? I don't know if we really got anything. Because we just... We gave up. <laughs> that's what happened. We gave up and said that was a nice idea, but that's not something we like. And you got to weed the garden. And in our text, there's a few weeds, aren't there? A few weeds in the soil that are trying to choke out the fruit that we need to get rid of if we're going to bear fruit. First of all, we see in the text, we need to get rid of the weeds of worry. In verse number 19, and the cares of this world. That's the first one that comes in, at entering in, chokes the word, and becometh unfruitful. The cares of this world. What are the cares of this world? Well, that's your worries. That's your cares. That's the things that we all get stressed out about. Have you ever felt stressed? Yeah, yeah, I felt stressed before. And uh, we all have. But you know what we're supposed to do with our cares, our stresses, our worries? Cast thy cares on the Lord, for he careth for you. And so often we get caught up with our concerns, with our cares, with our worries. And it causes us to leave our attention from the word of God. Do you know? Some things just don't grow together. Believe it or not, my wife and I, just this year, we decided to try to garden again. And you know what we did? We, uh, we got the planters on our deck or in our front entryway. And uh, we just a little garden. We figured if it's just little and it's right there, we can manage that. That's a good size. And so we decided on the vegetables we were going to plant. We said, okay, we're going to have beans. I had for lunch today. They were delicious, by the way. We had beans, and we had tomatoes, and we had cucumbers, and just planted them side by side. And right when we did it, Bethany told, I think it was Shushu, what we did. You know what Shushu said? She said, you know, that's not going to work. I said, why not? She said, well, beans, or not beans, tomatoes and cucumbers, they don't like each other. And while they might grow, and they might start having some fruit, it won't be good fruit. You know what happened? My cucumbers were like this big. And you know that's my favorite vegetable. I'm so thankful my mother's still gardening. She gave me four cucumbers yesterday, so I'm okay. But uh, my cucumbers, they failed. My cucumber plant is dead, and I still have lots of tomatoes. For some reason, that plant did great. Who cares about that? But the cucumbers... They didn't grow well beside the tomatoes. Well, you know what doesn't grow well beside, beside our worries? Our fruit for the Lord. If we're worried, if we're concerned, if we're caught up with the cares of this world, we're not going to be fruitful. The two don't grow well side by side. And our text is telling us that if you allow worry in the cares of this world, you're not going to be fruitful in the Christian life. We need to be free from the word, weeds of worry. You know what else doesn't grow well with, with our growth in the Lord? It's not just the weeds of worry, but secondly, it's the weeds of wealth. The weeds of wealth in verse number 19. And the cares of this world, but then secondly, it's the deceitfulness of riches. Riches are deceitful. You know, so often men make their decisions based on money and not on the word of God. We you say, but we need money. We need to pay the bills. We need to buy our food. We need it to make the world go around. So what's wrong with striving for money? Because don't you know that they don't grow together? You're the seed of the word inside of you. 
and your love of money, they don't grow together. The love of money will choke out the word so that it becomes unfruitful. You know, it's not that the Bible's saying that it's wrong to be blessed financially or something like that. But what the Bible speaks of in 1 Timothy chapter 6 is the love of money. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. Because when we start making money our goal, money our objective, then we're leaving God's word behind. And we're not going to be fruitful in our walk with the Lord. We need to be free from the weeds of worry and the weeds of wealth. But then thirdly, we need to be free from the weeds of wants. In verse 19, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. It's the wheat of wants, the wheat of our lusts coming in. It's the wheat of our selfish nature battling for our own will and our own desires. And you know, you read that word lust in the Bible and you often just immediately think, well, it's something, it's something sinful, it's something not right, it's something evil, impure. But it's not actually necessarily referring to that in this text. It's simply saying other things. Anything that we want outside of what the Lord wants for us. Anything that we go after other than the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. Those things that we go after and start chasing, not, not necessarily bad things. It might be a sport. It might be music. It might be education. It might be a career. It might be anything. These things that we go after. But if we start pursuing them and not Christ, we start going after these other things and not focusing on the word, it causes us to stop being productive to be unfruitful soil that doesn't grow or bear fruit. You can't be a productive Christian and be all about what you want. You need to pull that weed out so that you can be good soil and bring forth fruit for Jesus Christ. Now, I was thinking about this text, and I was thinking, you know, if I were to write this chapter, I'd rearrange it, you know? I'd say, okay, I'd still start with the, way, the seed by the wayside. I'd say, okay, that makes sense to be number one. The first thing we need to watch out for is as soon as you hear it, the devil coming and taking it away. But then I'd, I'd go with the next one as the stony ground. And then I'd say the third one would be the, the stony ground. Because if you can stand up against adversity, well, then you're going to make it. You're going to stand. You're, you're going to make it through the tests of life. But that's not the way our Savior told it, is it? Our Savior told it differently, and he was right. Now, how often do you see people receive the word and they stand against some adversity? They stand in hard times and they're going on with the Lord maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And then all of a sudden you look at them. They're not where they used to be. Not in church, not serving the Lord, no longer doing what's right. And you ask yourself, what happened? Where'd they go? They were so faithful. They were so committed. Well, it's that beneath the surface, what you and I couldn't see, beneath the surface, there was these thorns growing up, these weeds of worry or wealth or wants, these thorns growing up. Nobody knew they were there, but they must have known. And over time, they choked out the word so that it could bear no fruit. And Christian, we need to guard against that in our hearts and lives. Is that happening to you? Are you good soil? Are you bearing fruit? It's the parable of the sower, we call it, but really it's the parable of the soil. Which are you? I hope you're not on the wayside, too distracted, too hardened to even hear what God has to say. I hope you're not the seed on the stony ground who likes what you hear, but it hasn't taken root yet. And you're not sure what you'll do in adversity. I hope it's not the seed, you're not the soil of thorny ground where you like what you hear, but you like some other things too. You need to be the good ground. 
You need to have a heart that's open to God's word, resolved to stand, a heart that's pure and seeking Jesus and him alone. Be determined to be that soil tonight. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text. Lord, it's so, uh, so serious to think of that. So often people hear the word and they look like they're really enjoying and really growing in the Lord. But then they don't actually have the right kind of soil in their heart to grow and bear, bring forth fruit. Lord, I pray for each one here tonight that we'll be fruitful Christians. I pray that we will endeavor to keep ourselves, uh, to keep our hearts open, that we'll listen to your word as it's preached and as we read it in the scriptures. Pray that we'll endeavor to have hearts that, hearts that are resolved, to take a stand, resolved to go through the trials of life faithful to you. I pray, Lord, that we'll, res- that we'll have hearts that are pure, hearts that are focused on Jesus and him alone. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.